So the organizing principle behind the evening is the occasion of your latest novel, which is your first in, I believe, 49 years. I've tried to evade the 50 that's been bandied about. Um, first in 49 years. And um, the book points to a wider frustration um, that we're experiencing as a society at the moment. And we know that the book, whilst exhaustive, is still your thoughts submerged in words. And so we're hoping to explore that, explore the journey that led to that, to, to writing the book now, and basically where you see the state of things at the moment. So I will begin by, by acknowledging that we have a very wide audience here. Some, I think, are as young as their teens, and some as old as their 60s, right? If you're above that, forgive me. Uh, you, you. Yes. So. Um, one thing I realize is I'm somewhere in the middle of that, of that strata. And there are people in my generation who have a very keen awareness of you, your history, and your story. But there are also people who fall further behind on that spectrum. And we're hoping to just go through some of your early stages and your early formative stages, um, just to start things up and give people a sense of where you're coming from, which I believe will be helpful with the book. So um, to start off, um, You've been a very um, strong voice in Nigeria um, for as long as most of us can remember. And it's a trait you share with several family members, um, both your mom, your mother, um, your auntie, and your cousins. Um, so we're hoping you could speak a little bit to the starting spark that led you down this path of being a very vocal voice in Nigeria, a very strong vocal voice in Nigeria. Uh, first of all, yes, thank you very much for um, this invitation, which uh, your very energetic um, protagonist, Mr. Yemi Edun, uh, managed to insert into my already impossible program. But it was not too difficult, actually, for him, because uh, as many of you know here, I seize any opportunity to interact with Nigerians wherever I go. Um, and I was not about to, since I had a couple of days, I was not about to miss the opportunity of addressing Nigerians and discussing this work or whatever they wanted, especially at what I consider a very critical time for that quote unquote nation. Um, <clears throat> in other words, for me, this is not so much another launching of the book, but a town hall meeting. You know what that is. Uh, it's the recipe I have been recommending for Nigeria, the nation itself at this time. Uh, going even to the extent of saying that I see nothing less than a series of town hall meetings right across the whole nation. Frank, honest, brutal, uh, unsparing, and uh, absolutely uninhibited series of town hall meetings all over the place uh, in order to pull us out of the morass into which We've allowed ourselves to be, to be sunken by successive governments, regimes, but most importantly also emphasis on that, that we've allowed ourselves to be dragged into because uh, if the citizenry, the members of any community, whether you're talking of family, extended family, clan, uh, nation, ethnic nationality, state, what, call it what, by whatever name is defined, you can never absolutely avoid the basic fact that quite a large percentage of the fault lies in either the complacency or the complicity, uh, 
the, the, the lack of verve at critical moments of the people themselves. And I believe that it's time that we as human beings relating to one another, capable of even standing by ourselves without governments. Yeah, there are movements, you know, which believe that government in fact is a nuisance and that communities can actually exist without governments, believe it or not, but that's there. And maybe we have neglected self-questioning for far too long. And very convenient to put the blame somewhere, accurately by the way, accurately, always. But I think we've reached a stage, and now I'm referring to the mood of this book. It's a stage when we have to ask ourselves some very serious questions, you know, really deep, introspective, deep probing of ourselves as, as human beings uh, to even earn the moral right to question, to continue to question governance. Incidentally, a small correction. I notice in the uh, advertisement, the picture, it says this is the first book I've written in 50 years. About. <laughs> <laughs> what have I been doing <laughs> for the past 50 years? <laughs> you know, it's true that this is my first prose fiction. Distinction is important. In nearly 50 years, the first prose fiction. <clears throat> but I've been addressing the same themes in various forms, through theater, poetry, polemics, even through music, even though I'm not a musician. <laughs> you know, Unlimited Liability Company, the record. Sure it's all part of the same concern, the same, part of the same exposition. It's just that from time to time, there's emphasis more in one direction than another. And this is quite normal, it's quite basic. And so, for me, this is a town hall meeting, you know. <clears throat> I know there is a sprinkling of some white faces here. <laughs> we'll, we'll let them stay. <laughs> well, this, for me, another family meeting as I said, a kind of model of what I really would love to see taking place right throughout the whole nation, almost placing a moratorium on other forms of communication. We just seeing for one year, continuing, continuous, taking up one theme from another, passing it from north to south to west and so on, and just bypassing completely what has proved to be a most unfortunate experiment in governance. So now, as far as I'm concerned, we are now on our own. So let this be, shall we say, the beginning of such encounters. So I'm open to whatever questions, no matter what, uh, which may have been expressed or omitted or just uh, glossed over here, because after all, Nigeria is such a large, you know, such a large entity. This is just a small minus peep at the end. into the interstices of this place, this nation space, this piece of real estate that we call Nigeria. So questions? Okay. Well, next question. All right. So <clears throat> leading, leading on from that, um, I think we can underestimate how long you've been a force and a voice in Nigeria. For reference, for my mental reference, you were born somewhere between World War I and World War II. And the world... I've all said that again. I want to make sure I didn't miss it. You were born mm -hmm. between World War I and World War II. So, um, and the reason why that's important is this. You know, um, a lot of us, I mean, if you don't have a sense of history, a lot of new nations were born in the 1950s, 1960s, nations that never existed. So we had kingdoms back then. We had Prussia, we had Austro-Hungarian Empire. The world was a completely different place back then. 
and you were an eyewitness to those changes. Um, but most especially, you were an eyewitness to the birth pangs of the nation Nigeria. Now, something we all take for granted is that we don't have early memories of that time, but you do. And we're hoping you could share the light on what that era was, what hopes we had as a nation. And we're hoping that starting from there, we, we can begin to see how we went off along the journey <clears throat> and hopefully how we could get back. So anything you could share from that era or right. season. All right. Um, the, first the first point to stress is that my name is Wale Shoyinka. It is not Methuselah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I was not born World War I. Not World War I. <laughs> but I know the history, yes, like you yes, do, yes, like yes. everybody does. And I know the difference yeah. in the state of the world between mm. World War I and World War II. Yeah. And that, uh, that uh, difference is enormous. And it. Uh, it, it has a bearing on what is happening to us, but it's a very tangential bearing. Because after all, a child grows up. Uh, we cannot continue to the line of expression of, if you like, the memory recall, historic recall, which goes back a long time. We're obliged to, by the way, because the condition of the world today is related to that past, we can never avoid it. We cannot avoid talking about the slave trade, the enslavement of black people, whether from across the Sahara or across the uh, Atlantic, it doesn't matter, the color, the nation, the purpose. We know that we are a people of disdain, product of disdain from external forces. We cannot avoid talking about um, colonialism imperialism, neocolonialism, but we must also learn to talk about internal imperialism, colonialism, the same sense of alienation uh, of the governors, those who govern, who control the fortunes of people, whether externally or internally. We cannot avoid all of that. But ultimately, we are left on our own to ask ourselves, have we matured as a people, as a race, as nations? And what, what really is the origin, what are the origins of most of these so-called nations? And do we, when we call ourselves a nation, are we using the same terminology as other people outside? In other words, if they have a right to call themselves nation, do we also, simply because of waving the flag of independence, call ourselves nations? How do we come to be in the first place? Did we evolve, did we evolve organically? Or did we spring into existence around a table in Berlin when other nations, already self-cognizing nations, were able, were so confident and so arrogant that they could take a whole continent like Africa and parcel it out, draw almost like grid lines in whatever directions they wanted, economically, spiritually, culturally, and say this is this nation, this is that <coughs> nation, split evolving nations into bits and pieces and just join them together for their own purposes. You can talk of Pan-Africanism as much as you want, but have we, do, have we really begun to understand? These are the, I'm telling you the questions which we ask ourselves as students in this very environment or outside. Asking, okay, we're becoming independent now, but is it by our own will, those new entities, are they genuine? Are they simply convenient entities created for the advance of other peoples? These questions have become increasingly crucial as we butcher one another in the name of nation integrity. Look at what's happening even in Ethiopia today. In Ethiopia and Tigray. Uh, or 
Tigray, as some people call it. Look at what is happening. Is it really? How does this redound on us as uh, people know as Africans? Here is a nation which has just come out of a brutal, unbelievable, uh, just uh, what I call a mimic regime, mimic socialism regime under Mengistu, the Derg, which, however, was terminating an intolerable feudal condition, the imperial rule, alienated rule of Haile Selassie. But what happens after the Derg got there? Began to rule the people by the textbook. The textbook, which is the product of other societies, other formative histories, but ingested wholesale without being understood, without the ability to relate that ideology to the his history of Ethiopia, to the economic condition, the social conditions, the cultural conditions of Ethiopia, Miriam Mengistu said, no, I am now a Marxist. And this is the Marxist textology, which I'm going to follow. Killed thousands of people, students especially, piled up their corpses on the streets, invited Fidel Castro, whom I happen to admire, by the way. That's another story. <laughs> no, I do. <clears throat> invited him there to come and preside <clears throat> over the, uh, one of the celebrations there to show him how genuinely, how authentic they are along the Marxist line. And what is this demonstration of that? Corpses. So we're practicing the true uh, Marxist the dictatorship of the proletariat. In the meantime, under Mengistu, there were lines of uh, migrants again and again, year after year. No intelligent approach to what had become an annual, an annual parade of corpses, all moving to more benevolent areas, receiving hundreds lined the, all the tracks, the trails lined up with corpses of Ethiopians. And in the meantime, there he was dressing up, no different from the former feudal regime. The word is alienation, the alienation of governance, but very proud in being considered a progressive, butchering right, left, and center, year after year. Incapable, <clears throat> incapable of transforming society, but wanting to be admired by the leftist world. Then move to the other side, the capitalist world. There were the various countries who were slaves of the capitalist system of the external world, content in mimic productivity, but in actual fact, productivity that was geared to the needs of the Western capitalist world. What was the difference between the two? So there we were, we had really begun thinking for ourselves, but some of us, some of us insisted that we had to think for ourselves. Right across the continent, you had exceptions. Even Kwame Nkrumah, whom I criticized for his personality cult, at least he had a vision. He had a vision, he felt that this newly independent nation should at least utilize, mobilize its own internal resources, its own history, its own culture, and create a modern world. A modern world side by side, not in opposition to, but in complementarity to what was happening in the rest of the world. Yes, he had a number of faults. We criticized him, but at least we appreciated what he was trying to do. And so, as we're students here, you know, today I don't know how good your scholarships were, but in those days we had to supplement. And so we come, would meet from various areas in London, Hull, Leeds, uh, Canterbury, London, carrying um, 
uh, acting as part-time postal services during Christmas and Easter and your long vacation. The railways were there, you know, mm. as porters. Some of us even were bouncers <laughs> <laughs> in pubs. So we learned self-defense. Self-defense. And we studied what was happening in the world. We studied um, fascism. We saw what was happening in Spain. Um, even after World War II, uh, we saw the contest. <laughs> The contest between capitalism, and communism, socialism. We try to pick our way through, adjust here and there. But some of us refuse to f swallow whole the ideology of either side, for which, of course, we were reviled. Yeah, very much. You know, we were what we call middle of the road. Uh, socialists it didn't matter in the slightest. We did not accept the bequest of other nations, of other systems. We recognize the racism on both sides. We recognize the exploitation by both sides. We took note of when, for instance, just one example, one instance, when the cocoa that was leaving West Africa, not merely to the West, shifted now to the East. And in return, what did the Soviet Union supply? Commodity just piled up in the case which rotted in the tropical sun. I'm talking about Secretaris Guinea. The Soviet Union was supplying baby's teats. The, you know, these things which you put in at the end of the bottle for babies to yeah. suck. Yeah. Ah, yes. We saw the rubber rot away under the tarpaulin and yeah. the case. This is what was being sent in return. I don't need to stress what was being sent in return by the Western world. You all know that already, we know that. But we saw all this as just total content. We saw the, the, the cynicism of the Belgian Congo, Congo Free State, which was a private property of King Leopold of Belgium. And we saw the leaders, leaders like Mobutu Sese Seko, who became the puppets of the capitalist state like Belgium, which the entire, the minerals, the wealth of the Congo mm. was just being mm. dashed away mm. to Belgium just so that Mobutu could obtain his champagne already stamped with his own fist. This yeah. is what made us what we, we are, are today. today. These were the battles that we recognized mm -hmm. And we tried in our own way yeah. to, to confront, to fight, and try and extract from it yeah. a kind of self-respect, a dignity, and imaginative reconstruction of our society. It's yeah. not very complicated. It wasn't always right. Yeah. That doesn't matter. Yeah. The point is that we refuse to accept what appeared to be the general request, yeah. easily swallowed, not just by rulers, but by Half literate ideologues. That's I've said it up. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've spoken quite a lot about an era um, that we've faced as Africans, and that was a very important time. But you've also spoken about your personal involvement in that struggle. Um, would you like to talk about? Um, I don't want to call them the dark eras, but the years in between independence, Biafra, your incarceration, um, maybe even the Nadeko route, and, and um, coming back from exile, what that season looked like for you? Well, it's, it all stems mm -hmm. from this sense of preparation. Nothing surprised me, nothing, nothing, nothing surprised me about what eventually confronted us. Our leaders, we met them as students when they used to come for conferences, mm. uh, independence yeah, conference, the Whitehall, and we recognized the fact that uh, the battle was not over with independence. Let me put it that way. Let me summarize mm. it that way. We recognized the battle was only beginning, just a different 
change, uh, a difference in the characters on both sides. I don't mind, I've admitted it, it's in my book, so it's nothing new. Some of us even this felt that we should prepare ourselves for combat. I joined personally, the officer cadet of my university in Leeds. Uh, but then I hadn't fully appreciated the battle then. I thought the battle was all south, that our generation was to go down south and liberate apartheid South Africa liberate the settler colonialism in the then obscenely titled Rhodesias, named after one individual, a murderer, multiple murderer, exploiter. Uh, and of course, Belgium was the case you know, on its own. But we also studied the first comma generation leaders, so through the rhetoric, and then so we turn our attention from external liberation to what I call primary liberation from a new wave of imperators who shared our own skin, supposedly our own culture, and said that after this external liberation, there had to be internal liberation. And that's where all the problem really <laughs> began. Because they would have been happy to see us marching down south, mm -hmm. getting rid of this nuisance, mm -hmm. while they continued the despoilation at home. And being conscious of history made it impossible for some of us to accept going to war for the preservation of externally donated boundaries. Till today, till tomorrow, I consider, for instance, the civil war in Nigeria and the civil war anywhere on the continent for the preservation of external boundaries, some of the most stupid, uh, stupid attitude, positions of independence leadership that you would say you would go to war and kill one another to defend artificial boundaries, externally donated boundaries. It's something which till today I cannot understand supposedly intelligent people, you know, undertaking, fall, falling into that kind of trap. And that is why till today, the continent of Africa is not settled. One of the most pernicious doctrines that came out of independence was in, I think the decision was in, was it Liberia or Tunis? I can't remember. One of the cardinal, cardinal uh, decisions taken was the respect for colonial boundaries. We shuddered at this self-inflicted insult that you are coming together to form a continental organization called the OAU, Organization of African Unity. And one of the basic decisions you take is respect for colonial boundaries. What is that? You didn't talk about you know, we emphasize the economic uh, transformation. Yes, they did, but token. But the basic mentality was respect my boundary and I respect you. I want to be king of this little pond of authority which has been led by a colonial office. You respect me. Scratch my back, I scratch yours. You can say what you like about economic principles, culture, and so on. I believe that part of the problem in fact, the central aspect of the problem we're undergoing today has to be that decision, that failure of nerve, of creative nerve, at the very beginning, to say, all right, this is what we've been left with. Now, let us see if it works. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, what do we do? How do we tinker with it? Or do we just go back to basics and start all of it? No, I'm not, this is not hindsight. Uh, projection, no. I'm telling you what we discussed among ourselves, what uh, generated, what instigated the kind of attitude, the position which we took even after independence on many issues, including issues of genuine internal independence till today. And so when people say I'm a bear friend, thank you. When the, when the Biafran say, you didn't go far enough, I say, thank you. You were not born at the time. 
So go and sit down somewhere. <laughs> you can't get your, your something. You, you don't know anything at all. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and that brings us, I think, home to the present day, um, Nigeria as it is. And I stole this quote from a line, and I hope it's, it's accurate, but um, it's quoting you. And it's saying that even during the Civil War, I do not believe that we devalued humanity as much as we do today. It's I'm like, not sorry, repeat that. <laughs> sorry. So even during the Civil War, mm -hmm. I do not believe that we devalued humanity as much as we do today. Yeah. It's like something has broken in society, in something I used to take for granted. Um, yeah. yeah. And that leads us to this book, uh, this work of prose. Um, there's a, the, the only quote I have with prose in it is from Mario Cuomo. And it says, politicians campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Mm -hmm. So um, reality always leads us to prose. And um, like you said, poetry wasn't sufficient in this instance. Neither was an article. Only prose will do. So um, diving into that, may I ask, why did you choose a satirical medium, especially for the literary minds here, to, to explore the topic or to discuss this um, matter? Why did I choose? A satirical medium. The, the, the book, yes. The yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, consider this. Um, Chibok. Let's just take Chibok. Let's begin with Chibok. Here we are, largely inheritors of uh, a slaving theology by the external world in which we were complicit, by the way, because we collaborated also in the success of the slavery. We actually hunted one another down. Many people don't like to hear it, but it's the truth. The wealth of many families, for instance, in my part of the world, commenced with involvement in the slave trade. The names are there. The, 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 the museums are even there, kept by families of slaves. So we were part of that. But at the time, at least, there was some labor involved. People went hunting the slaves, sometimes even sold their own families down the drain. And then they were taken away across the Sahara, across the Atlantic. What's happening today? They don't need to go hunting very much. All they need to do is uh, acquire AK-47s, even sometimes bows and arrows, poisoned arrows, and wait. And when we all send our children to school, they wait, and the children are there. No defense. They just move in and gather everybody up. Come on drag them into the forest, and then tell their parents, their institutions, and their governments, state government and central government, come and buy them back. Now, how does that differ from the old slave trade? This is a resumption of the slave exercise. Only this time, it's simpler, it's easier, it's cheaper. Make sure there's an impregnable uh, enclave, and so you sweep in one, you know, just one blow, you have 300 slaves, and usually you go for the women so they can be sold into sex slavery. I mean, where do you think half the Chibau girls are today? They can't be found, they're all scattered, they've all been sold to the slave market. And when that works, they move in again and tackle another school. The government pays some ransom, and they use that ransom. These uh, worshippers of the one god use that ransom to buy new weapons and to fortify their enclaves and recreate their slave markets. Uh, Dabiri, the special advisor on the diaspora, has her work cut out for her trying to rescue Nigerian slaves in the Libyan markets today. So the period of disdain 
of us as a people <laughs> is by no means over. Only it's been made cheaper. Today, the failure of leadership, failure to produce, uh, to create economically viable zones of existence called nations makes even some of us sell ourselves into slavery. I'm talking about today, right now, as I'm speaking. A slave markets in Mauritania, a slave markets in Libya, and who are being sold there? It's not white people, it's not Asians and so on. It's Africans. And from time to time, Tabri and the others, they work mm -hmm. to rescue a number of Nigerians, and these planes land on our soil in our presence. And these rescued slaves descend, some of them kiss the ground. Others can't wait to go back again to sell themselves. Yes, in slave markets. Yeah. It's true. But the worst part for me, the most unacceptable, unconscionable part, is that we have allowed the kidnapping, the trade, the slave trade in children to become the norm. This, for me, is the most horrifying aspect of existence. And so, I did write a long poem to Chibok. I called it a humanist ode to Chibok Lear. Lear was a girl who refused to convert as a condition of release. Yes, I was able to, to get something off my psyche by writing such poems. But it's not just the incidents alone. It's the totality of the environment that has allowed this uh, degradation of our humanity to take place after the hopes, the ambitions, the visions, the Renaissance thinking of my generation. I mean, who could have thought of this when I was growing up? Who could have thought of this when I was studying? In Europe, who'd have studied, who'd have thought of this possibility when I was, you know, gallivanting around in my theater company and writing poetry and writing songs and so on? Who could have thought we'd reach the stage where our own humanity would take, would even develop relations with the opposite sex for the sole purpose of? tricking those partners, those friends, those lovers, to the herbalist to have his or her throat cut for ritual purposes. Every day, this is taking place. There's a recent one, you know, one businessman is an accountant. In Ife, my former yeah, roosting ground, the university, the cradle, of the black people, quote unquote, he lay fair with this accountant who was coming to the University of Ife every weekend, every week for uh, a master's degree. You know, he's working somewhere in Abuja. And yet the landlord of that, uh, of, that hot of that hotel, called the Hilton incidentally, you know, <laughs> the Hilton, Nigeria, finally, trapped him, killed him. When they found his corpse, vital organs missing, the heart I think was missing, and killed again for ritual purposes. It's like everything we touch is degraded. Look at that marvelous concertation of youth and Mars, uh, and Sars, I beg your pardon, <laughs> and Sars, in which the youth suddenly said, we want to take this nation back actually mobilized a very well-constructed, well-organized um, movement, only to have even that degraded. First, by the state force, state union, uh, state agencies fired into the crowd. Then what happened when the response came. The response was not by the organizers, no. The response was by the general citizenry who had nothing to do 
with the organizing of that mm. revolutionary movement. No, mm. they went out to express themselves by killing supposedly police, anybody in police uniform. What do they do? They distribute the roasted quote-unquote newspaper language, which is language has also been debased. They roasted, let us say that, and then shared the pieces to go and make juju money-making rituals with them. Was that what NSAS was about? So something has happened to us as a people. Yeah. The, the gradation, the degradation process, man, you can give it any reason you like. The glut of oil, where money became the principal thing, you wanted your share of it. But whatever it is, something has happened. The devaluation of the human uh, factor in any community, the basic, the basis of community, which is the human being. There's that loss of respect for it, value for it. What is the case with Cynthia? Cynthia, that girl who was tricked. And we're not talking about impoverished people. Mm -hmm. This is very important. So before you come at me with any sort of economic degree, no, no, we're talking about, you know, well-fed students, talking about business people who already have more than enough. And yet, serially, they kill just to make money. That's why I'm saying uh, we need a series of introspective sessions in that country to understand what has happened to us. Many people understand. They, they know what is happening. They see what is happening. Many of them come home, and after a few months, they say, I'm going back. I know the number of people are persuaded to come back and donate their talent to the nation. What you, I don't even call it NASA. Call it a medical uh, expert in Saudi Arabia or Dubai and so on, who've come back through the, uh, the pleading of some of us, persuasion discussion, and so I say, okay, we'll come back. Within a few months, you said, mm -mm, we're going back where there's job fulfillment, where there is some kind of yeah, res respect, some kind of decency, even if that regime is cruel. They feel that they're among human beings, resisting mm. the cruelties yeah. of that government, not collaborating with them, giving them excuses to degrade the humanity further. And so whether it's a job for um, psychologists, clerics, um, humanists, historians, whatever, Something has happened to us as a people. There's no way you can escape it. And that is what, at my age, I find very difficult to cope with. Yeah. Thank you. Please clap. Um, you, you've touched on a couple of very um, interesting and salient points. And I think the you see how stuck the contrast is between your generation and our generation. And what comes to mind is the boiling frog problem, where you slowly turn up the heat before the frog realizes it's being boiled. We, um, I think where we are on some level as a society may mirror delusion. And I say that in this sense. And I think most Nigerians will agree, regardless of what part of the spectrum you occupy, we are not in the promised land. Um, and. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are not in the promised land. And that has been a very, uh, and I, be, that, I believe that went into the title of the book, Chronicles of the, uh, from the land of the happiest uh, uh, people on earth, which was based off of the, the, the infamous survey. <laughs> Would you like to speak about that and why that's stuck in your mind? The, 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 yes. the title. Yes. Well, in the midst of all of this, <laughs> A Gallup poll, or whatever poll, Gallupium poll, whatever they call it these days. Uh, now, of course, uh, I don't know how they do their um, assessment. I read. I come across, this is quite a while ago. Suddenly, I come across a poll which has been taken 
to determine, you know, you have the most corrupt nations, the world. we've been there. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The most expensive cities to live in, we've been there. Um, what else? I don't know. The dirtiest cities in the world, we've been there. And then, in the midst of this, I see that we have won <laughs> nearly first place in the stakes of happiness. The contradiction is such that I, I, I don't know how to cope with it. Mm. And so when, I, when all of this was welling, you know, welling up in my mind, I was looking for a title. Mm. I said, OK, <laughs> let me borrow the title. <laughs> the, maybe they know something I don't know. <laughs> so that's how the title uh, came about. And of course, it's an ironic, uh, mm. obviously, an ironic yes. title. But it's amazing. And before, I know you want me to read this small section of that. I'll read in a moment. Uh, at the same time, I, a portion of me sympathizes uh, and find some kind, an element of justification in that title in a non-ironic way. And that is that I have a feeling that those who, you know, who were consulted, who gave their votes here, have been to Nigeria before or have encountered Nigerians before. And I've always marveled that they seem to be survivalists. Uh, they seem to be proud of their culture, even when the culture goes haywire, like the culture of ostentation and exhibitionism and over-consumerism and so on. You see the way we celebrate deaths, births, you see our Owambeism. <laughs> and, and so perhaps what they're saying that is that in spite of all the negativities, that the, the very fact that they, especially those they meet outside, that they manage to uphold something, they manage to insist on what they are. So it's like you are the ones who have to balance the irony in my <laughs> head and my um, uh, devil's advocate, mm -hmm. uh, advo advocacy uh, of the people. And also, they meet productive people, Nigerians. I, I spoke to you earlier about how uh, I, I run into Nigerians in all kinds of places. I remember my ex the excitement I had when, for instance, I learned that uh, Nigerians were, par were part of the NASA team that produced uh, parts of the rockets that went into space. Many Nigerians don't know this. We don't push this. You know. Some of them had experiments uh, actually taken on board uh, to, be, uh, to be worked upon in uh, weightless uh, mm -hmm. space. Oh, but then, <laughs> To the reverse, it's a small anecdote, I just remember this. <laughs> Don't let me forget it, I will read it, I will we'll read it, don't worry. Yeah, uh, I remember one is in Houston, it was a scientist, and it, it was during the period we were fighting Sonia Abacha, and uh, so always seizing on any positive things to keep our morale up. Uh, I learned about this, uh, uh, this professor, who, uh, in fact there were two of them, I think one was medicine, one was uh, physics. And we went to the home of these physicists. We wanted to get details so that we could promote this and so on and so forth. And you know, he shut the door on us. Uh, um, he said he didn't want to talk to any Nigerians. I swear to you. He was in Houston. And if you ask some of our people in Nalikon, and uh, they said, I don't to contact him. This is the period when um, uh, J, um, May Jemison, the, the marvelous woman, the first woman astronaut, had just taken up it during that period, you know, and we'd had a, again a town meeting which, in, to which she was invited. She came and spoke to us and so on. And so we wanted to present this, um, this genius. And for some reason, just not the wife said, no, it was not at all. Just wouldn't. What the politics were there, I have no idea, but we had the document, we had the experiment, the experiment you've been working on. And this is somebody we're very proud of, and we wanted to push. But 
Again, this part of the contradiction of Nigerians. Sometimes, you know, they are head they turn, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand. I don't understand it at all. You know. <laughs> but okay. uh, to bring things home, you have people also like the um, this young fellow who organized this town hall meeting. And I, before I accepted to come, I went and studied, you know, to make sure it wasn't one of those whose uh, skyscrapers constantly <laughs> explode. You know, I wasn't taking any chances. And I was very happy to accept to come because these are the Nigerians who are responsible for the positive side of this kind of title. Yeah, happiness is just. You know, People we should be very proud of. Okay. Um, so two, page two fifty-three. That's the one you're going to. Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. Very quick question. Um, how many people have read the book so far? I've ah, spoken of well, after this. Let them ask questions. No problem. <laughs> so your your introduction to the book would be by personal reading from Professor Walisha Inka. I think that's pretty awesome. <clears throat> okay. So. This is a typical event in which um, the, something inside, uh, almost like the collective infectious negative psyche of Nigeria is coming to play. So, <clears throat> later that evening, uh, during the day, when two of the characters here driving along the street, they see a typical Nigerian scene, one that has become so commonplace now, even in cities, capitals like Lagos, Abuja, name it. Later that evening, television narrated the full story. After futile spurts of preventive measures, authority had commenced arrests of vendors, and seizures of their wares, these traffic problems. The last man, and this is a real event, the last man, the van parked in a side street, had pursued several such malfeasance. In a desperate attempt to escape capture, one ran straight into the snout of a speeding vehicle, was tossed up, landed with an ominous thud on the sidewalk and remained there unmoving. In a trice, a mob had gathered. They set the park last not vehicle on fire and worked up further appetite for vengeance. The unarmed officers had already fled. A hunt party pursued and eventually brought down a scapegoat quite some distance from the actual scene of the crime. They proceeded to the ritual battering of their catch. He broke free, ran into the gutter, tried crawling into the culvert for safety. They dragged him out by the feet, trunk and head smeared and reeking from the accumulated sludge of the blocked tunnel. Passers-by, totally ignorant of the beginning or mid-act of the mayhem, refused to be left out. They grabbed the nearest assault weapon to hand and joined in the gratification of the thrill for the day. A new breed citizen phenomenon, the massive stone raised above a throng of heads, quivered slightly against the Lagosian skyline of ultra-modern skyscrapers before its descent into the bone and brain. It took an iconic dimension that struck instantly to Menka's surgical album of retention, a rampant insight of the transfiguration of a collective psyche. I envied you, Menker remarked the following morning as they confronted the printed media coverage. 
the scalding coffee, no match, for the nausea aroused by the photograph sensationally smeared across the front page. You are going away for a while, you'd be spared such sights. I feel guilty, confess duly, guilty, but yes, this is one spectacle I shall not miss. Careful, Menka quickly cautioned. They have the equivalent over there in the United States. Ask the black population. No, not like that. Occasionally, yes. There erupts a Rodney King scenario or a fascistic spree of I can't breathe. America is a product of slave culture, prosperity as a reward for racist cruelty. This is different. This, let me confess, reaches into a word I would rather avoid but can't, reaches into soul. It challenges the collective notion of soul. Something is broken beyond race, outside color or history. Something is cracked, can be put together again. And then Peter Payne gasped, paused, folded over the pages and passed the newspaper to Menka. Take a look at that. Not that it matters, not that it changes anything, but here, here, just read, read it yourself. There was a chastening coda. It altered nothing. The fleeing vendor, whom no one had even thought to help, was very much alive. He had picked himself up, salvaged most of his scattered goods, and found his way home, despite a, a sprained ankle and some bruises. Most of the spectators had retreated to a side distance, to a safe distance. They continued what they had been doing earlier, filming the action with their phone cameras. The police did, however, capture the Goliath with the terminal, the terminating stone, who had administered the coup de grace. He remained on the spot, to all appearances, admiring the evidence of his work. He vehemently protested the injustice of his arrest. I thought he was an armed robber, he said. <laughs> and and let, let, let me bring that narrative, which was written at least a year ago, right down home to the present. I was not far from that building which collapsed in Ikoi, Lagos, recently, just a few weeks ago. I was not, I was staying right there. And of course, the moment I heard the news, I wanted to rush out and see what help could be given. And then I heard sirens and so on and so forth. I said, oh, well, the experts are going to be there. I won't bother to you know, um, make myself a nuisance. Time. What could I do? So I went back to, the, to, my, to the apartment where I was staying and turned on the television to see what was going to see if I really, you know, uh, if everything was in hand. And I saw a spectacle which Till this moment, the recollection of it just nauseates, just disgusts me. During the rescue process, some people, some bodies and some uh, still alive were being taken out of the rubble and being put into an ambulance. And your countrymen and women were obstructing at rescue operation because they wanted to take photographs with their stupid little cameras. And they were actually battling the paramedics who were trying to place a human being in an ambulance 
really fighting for space so they could get pictures, so they could post on their stupid Facebooks, you know, because they, they were now uh, maybe newspaper for media photographers. And when my daughter uh, wrote, they you know, sent a message checking if I was okay and so on and so forth. And I said, don't even talk to me. I don't want to hear anything about this. And, uh, and I told her what I was seeing. And she said, what did you see? And I wrote back and described this thing. He said, you didn't see the whole thing. And then she go, went on to tell me there were other uh, uh, captures of the same scenario taking place. You couldn't help, you wouldn't stand aside. You didn't even offer to help, no. Our people were taking pictures and fighting, obstructing the work of the rescue teams. And I said, what on earth have I got into? What, where have I been living all these years that I did not anticipate this kind of thing? So we have a lot of work to do, I'm sorry, uh, outside governments, outside governance. Something, as I say here, something has broken and makes it possible for a human being to start pushing aside paramedics who are rescuing other human beings. I don't know any other society in which this kind of thing can be accepted, that those people are not arrested and locked up and even gone butted. And then you <laughs> come and tell me about police uh, cruelty. <laughs> Yes, thank you for that, um, Professor. Um, it's definitely a sobering reflection. Um, and, and on that note, um, the audience before you are Nigerians in the diaspora in the United Kingdom. And through your many travels, you get to meet Nigerians in different corners and parts of the world. What would you say is the distinguishing feature you've seen across all the Nigerians you've seen in different parts of the world? And what does that mean for the future of Nigeria? To be more specific, what role do you think, or what charge would you place basically in our care in terms of the work to be done? A restoration of community. Community has been lost across the nation in Nigeria. I think many of you here, you still are close to functioning community. They are close to how uh, a people survive outside governance. Or put it this way, you live in a place where even if the central government governance is not working, community governance works. I don't say it's perfect, no, but I'm saying that community governance still works. And where it is broken down, whether you're talking about a black community or an Asian community and so on, there's still a kind of recognition of the fact that these are human units, humanized units, and still not so centralized as to, as to forget the existence of quote-unquote neighbor. At home, we're even losing the sense of neighbor. Sometimes, even the neighbor exists only as a means to, <laughs> you understand. Uh, and, and so, when you come back, this is one of the reasons I've been fighting for the creation of, um, for the restoration of communities in terms of self-policing. It's something I've always believed in, community policing, as opposed to centralized policing. It's one of the reasons I deliberately put this on. I think some of you know what this is. <laughs> it's my amotecum. <laughs> I so harassed my governor in Ogun State. He said, what are you doing? Why don't we have our own amotecum? Why are you allowing Undo government, that young lawyer there, over there, to beat you to amotecum? But apparently, it's been working on it, you know, very systematically also. And so when he launched his Amoteco, made sure I was there, and made me the grand marshal of the <laughs> Amoteco. 
But I think it's only a return to that principle that can really salvage us as human beings. It cannot be from the center. It cannot be from the center. Never could have been from the center. But it's even worse for us today when you have at the center somebody whom you are persuaded has become a born-again Democrat in the morning, then by evening you discover that he's now a born-again Fulani herdsman. You know. And how are you supposed to cope with a situation like that? You return to your roots and try and strengthen the roots. And then you can tell the center, go to hell. You know, uh, you take what belongs to you, you make sure that you take the last penny that you are entitled to in terms of the productivity of your uh, community and you strengthen the communities. I don't say go so far as to you know, start demanding secession and so on and so forth. That is a lot more complicated and it requires a lot more discussion, uh, including even <coughs> strategies, if let us say you want to separate. It's not the same world as it was, you know, in the time of the Biafra. Things have changed a lot. And there are many ways in which uh, decentralization, I believe, can be pursued. But in principle, human beings have a right to govern themselves, to form their own communities, and to try and be as self-sufficing as possible. That's the principle. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, <clears throat> That's definitely a, a very, very important point. Um, not to replicate the Gallup poll, um, the poll about the happiest people on earth, uh, sorry, the Nigeria being the happiest land. Um, but I think we've had in several discussions, um, when we come to the discussion on the people who we would say their voices bear the conscience of the land, I would say your name would pop up. You may shriek from it, but that is our present reality. And um, in that stead, you know, there are a lot of moral compromises we've seen made as a society, and a lot of them are explored in the book, very richly and very, um, very creatively. And there's something to that moral compromise. Um, it stops you from being able to speak loudly and clearly. What would you say to encourage the budding voices to stay the course and for their voices to rise in the future? to defend this, or to defend and to be back where we are now as people? Well, my attitude is that people, citizens, must learn to stop being crybabies. <laughs> By crybabies, I don't mean uh, not complaining. I don't mean not criticizing. No, no, no. I'm talking about crying over split milk. The, there's a, a lot of self-excusing going on. And uh, you wait four years each time, are wasted. Another four years, wasted. You try this system, it hasn't worked. And instead of getting together to, um, to really redirect both thinking and action, you find Nigerians sitting on the and saying, oh, it's the fault of that one. He was responsible for this government. Uh, therefore, there's nothing we can do about it. And instead of even confronting the evil, the negativities, and so on, they waste their energies, their cries, just whining and uh, blame passing to reassure themselves that they don't have to do a thing. So the first principle is accept responsibility also for yourself, for your existence, for the situation, the condition, and just stop whining. There's just too much whining. The crybaby, there's a new crybaby culture, and most of it we know what sections they come from. And it's like, and also understand the fact that Nigeria is a very vast space. It's several nations in one. And therefore, there will always be conflicts between the nations. Once you adopt the principle of, I will not be cheated, 
as a group, and I will not cheat as a group. And the only way you can uh, establish and act on that principle is to concentrate as much as possible on the, the evol evolution, the progression, the productivity of your own community. It's from that secure position when you feel confident that you are capable even of reproducing and enhancing the means to your own existence. Ah, then you can talk on an equal basis to other people. And this is where I think the diaspora comes in. Um, the diaspora, the diaspora, not just Nigerians, but Africans generally, they have seen how other societies work. And they have seen what makes the other societies, other societies where they exist, unravel. And they've seen how it is possible, how the system ensures that it doesn't unravel to a point where it cannot be stitched together. In other words, there are balances, uh, not just the constitutional balance, but what I call the community balance that exists everywhere. You're in a position where you witness the shame of a continent in the migration waves. You're in a position where you're in daily... In Nigeria, many people don't believe that Nigerians are drowning in the Mediterranean. Let me tell you that. They are not aware at home that our fellow Nigerians are drowning. Even during the COVID periods, they still were trying to cross the Sahara. They still were crowding into boats and sinking in the Mediterranean just to get to, quote unquote, greener pastures. Uh, at home, the problems are so enormous that many people are just not aware that this problem spills over the, the border. But the diaspora, they have no excuse. You're in daily contact with, uh, with the media, um, you listen to debates in the EU, uh, in nations. You are part and parcel of policies which result in Brexit, whether you like it or not. You pay your taxes here, so these are your people. You vote, you vote for them. <laughs> you come there, and you know that Brexit is a policy of keeping out those who actually are in need refuge either for political or economic reasons. And it's a shame. You cannot be at ease when you see uh, NGOs uh, acting in a humanitarian way, even against the policies of their own government. It's an example which illustrates to you what you're capable of or what you can do as citizens. You know, even if you just come home sporadically, you know, a month or two at a time. You see the dignity with which our fellow Nigerians are being buried when they are fished from the sea, a dignity which is denied our own people at home. I know how I've been pursued by um, some local governments in Ostania, Lampedusa, in, um, in Italy, on the coast of Italy, just asking me, you know, they found some new bodies, they carry Nigerian passports, I'm a Nigerian, could I supply them at least a line or two to be read over their graves? I have photographs mm. of Nigerians, you know, corpses, in, being given a dignified send up. Things which we deny ourselves at home. It's shaming. It's shaming to see other people outside respecting our bodies. I wish their governments would respect us where we're living, but at least afterwards you see how they how they treat uh, uh, you know the victims of their own government policies, and so you are in a position, I think, to bring outside but internal influence on the negativist and fatalistic. Um, temperaments which have evolved over time as a result, of course, of government neglect. There's a lot which you can do. Maybe you can even invite more 
young people to come over. Oh, of course, that requires getting visa. They won't give Nigerians visa. <laughs> I, keep, I keep forgetting that, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so, but you can still do what you can with what you have here, yeah, you know. Fair enough. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. You're welcome. Okay. Um, at this stage, I'd um, like to take some questions from the audience. Yes, just one or two. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please put up your hand and a microphone will locate you. There is a gentleman in the left corner over there. Could we please? Thank you very much. Um, Sir, for coming to see us in London here. My name's Jonathan Banjo. I've just um, recently read the book on Finnish greatness by, I can't remember the chap's name, I think it was Femi somebody of Awolor. And I've always wanted to ask someone this question, and you're the perfect person to ask. If um, Awolor had become president in 1979, which I think was obstructed by Obasanjo and others, do you think we'd be in the position we are today in Nigeria? Sorry, could you, I, your problem with my hearing aid. <laughs> so, <amazing. laughs> so, and let, let, me know if I, let me know if I get this correct. If Awolowo was voted president, will we be where we are today in Nigeria? If I answer that question truthfully, they will say I'm a Yoruba chauvinist. So I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> question voided. Um, gentleman at the back, please. Sir, I've, uh, I've got a question. Uh, as, a, as a fellow Egba man, what's the story between uh, yourself and OBJ? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> should I repeat it or should we leave it? The usual love-hate relationship. <laughs> Maybe you don't know that. We're again talking to each other and even trying to collaborate. Uh, on some uh, positive issues. Uh, I, I have no permanent enemies. Um, I, just, I just like, I'm just obsessed with truth, that's all. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a, a reminder, let's keep our questions answerable. Could we have the lady at the back, please? Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Shakira. My question is, um, we, the Yorubas, within the Nigerian community, because I know here in the UK, a lot of people are clamoring for a Yoruba nation. And I am of the school of thought that even as um, each state or nation or communities, I can't really say, I can say what my governor has done, or even the chairman, there's always that excuse that, oh, it's from the presidency. Even regarding security, oh, we can't do anything. Essential. So there's these constant excuses, yet some people feel the need to have a Yoruba nation, and I feel it's just another tussle for power within themselves, even after the nation has been created. I would like, you, I would like to know your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, first of all, there are many nationalities within Nigeria. That's the truth. We're not talking about ethnic groups now. We're saying that nations, uh, either nations in formation or nations in reality, have been broken up and re-stitched, quilted, re-quilted together. And the history of nations is that uh, boundaries have always been fluctuating, whether on the African continent, on the European continent. Take the Balkans, for instance. What are the Balkans? What's Yugoslavia uh, today? What was it before? And so on. And so uh, the principle of self-cognizing and self-resituating, uh, uh, is there's nothing wrong with it. For me, it's, it's, it's just grotesque, the very notion of going to war and killing one another over boundaries. If it becomes uh, expedient, if it becomes rational and advantageous, even to the nation itself, that there is a Yoruba nation, an Igbo nation, a Tiv nation, a Hausa nation, 
What's wrong with that? Nations exist for human beings, not the other way around. In fact, one of my favorite expressions is, let nations die that humanity may survive. And if that is the, what it takes for human beings to be at their productive best and to be in genuine, harmonious, collaborative relationships with other nation entities, just what? Morally, spiritually, philosophically can be said against that beyond the will for power. And many people equate power with size. They equate power, the experience of power with presiding over a pond, either inherited, bequeathed, but once it's there, they say, ah, this is it. I don't want it tampered with. For me, it's very backward thinking. Now, that's not to say that I believe people should now go into a, a secessionist spree or just wake up one day and say, okay, we just want to be on our own. But there have been a variety of reasons why peoples all over the world have said, we want to be our own nation. And unless you can fault those rationally, you should listen and debate, discuss, and come to a kind of mutual understanding based on respect and based on humanity as a first principle of any organizing, any organized entity, whatever name you give it. The humanity in there for me is over and beyond and above the mere real estate because it's humanity which works that is it. Otherwise, it's just virgin territory, it's just there, it's inert. What does it mean without the humanity? And so I have nothing against the Yoruba nation and I have nothing for the Yoruba nation. I'm just interested in what works best for the human the humanity inside, within that piece of real estate. On a personal level, I can tell you that I am tired of getting visas for my passport, you know, and the new nations mean new visas. And you know what <laughs> queuing for visa is like, you know. So on a personal note, selfish note, I hope things stay as they are, but then that's a very concerning. I'm just lazy. Okay, some, uh, some, um, some consulates, even before I ask, they offer. There are some other ones stingy, uh, and others, some don't even charge me. Britain continues to charge me for visa <laughs> till tomorrow. <laughs> Very shameless country. <laughs> you know, let me charge you tomorrow. Thank you for charging for visa. Let's just work best with what we have, as, much, as best as we can. OK, all right, we'll take two more questions. Um, ooh, please, keep your questions constructive. Um, sir, the gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Good evening, Prof. Um, you said something very profound, that something is broken within our society. And you also posited that to fix it, we should start from our communities. Well, if you look across the width and length of the country, every single society or community seems to be suffering from the same malaise. So my question is, can this be fixed from our respective corners of the wood, or we should make a concerted effort to tackle this from the center. Thank you. My, the way I will answer that, the way I will answer that is to refer to something which happened in the Ikorodu environment. Maybe some of you remember Bedu. Bedu, there's a kind of nasty, Cultists or Baidu, Baidu or what they call it. Baidu. Baidu. Okay, you know. Which something we defied the police, these murders, ritual murders, uh, resulting in a seizure 
of that entire uh, community. It, it completely, literally seized up. And eventually, the, that attack, that pandemic, <laughs> was actually solved by the community coming together, holding meetings, presided over by the Oba, Oba uh, Eco area, and eventually, this thing ceased. I haven't had the opportunity to visit, uh, um, to be the other to ask in details of how it was done. But you know, who hears about that uh, that cult anymore? And the same thing, uh, the same principle can be used, no matter what the problem is in any community. That includes nature-induced. Um, um, <clears throat> disasters or attacks like COVID. It's one of the reasons why when, and I, I, I understand the, um, the sense of your question because there are people who pretend to be the community. They bring themselves up to be spokespeople for their communities, but they are false. The, and they try to prove that, they try to establish that position. They're actually after power, nothing else. They're not for the community. And they try to do that by imposing their will on other communities. Well, when you have a situation like that, of course, you resist. You put them in their place by whatever means necessary. When COVID, uh, this thing called COVID-19, struck in Nigeria, it was interesting how, quote unquote, some spokespeople for the government who were in actual fact spokespeople and protagonists and spearheads for the domination by their community of, in fact, the rest of the nation. And there was an instance, I don't know if you learned about, when uh, because of the lockdown, an attempt was made to transfer what should be community authority knowledge, intelligent uh, use of that knowledge because of the uh, neighborliness between uh, communities to transfer it to the center. Now, this said, and you know what I'm talking about, this said this was a, a central decision for the benefit of the whole nation. But it was obvious it was a lie. It was a lie, it was their opportunity. That's how cynical some of these people in government can be. For them, they didn't see the disease, they didn't see the affliction, they weren't thinking in terms of the community. No, it's the agenda of domination that they were using COVID to try and push. And if you remember, I made a statement at the time. I said, mind your own business in the center. Yes, there are certain aspects of COVID control, which like the borders, the national borders and so on, which would be the right of the center. But this one, arrangements between the various states, you skip out of that because you are too distant from the realities of those. It's not the business of the center. You don't know. I mean, you're talking about states. You want to, from the center, you want to lock down movements between Ogun State and Oyo State, between Kaduna State and, uh, which is next one, Kogi State. You cannot do that. You have no business with that. And I said that because I knew, and as some of them, Austin, what their real agenda was, it was to use that opportunity to, do, to carry out their mission, their obsessed mission of domination, of control of other communities. And of course, as usual in these matters, we were right. Within a few weeks, you had the government um, task force 
saying, you know, as for these areas, we're leaving it to the various states to decide. And I said, there you are, you get it. I would say that. <laughs> so when we talk about communities, we have to be very much aware of the poseurs, uh, those with very, very sinister agenda, who are so just unprincipled that they will use a pandemic to try and further the domination of other communities. Those are the real enemies of humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we, we do still have to be mindful of time, so we're going to have to round up the questions at that point. Um, I find that there's an immortality granted um, to our thoughts by words. Okay, what's up? There's an immortality granted to our thoughts by words. Mm -hmm. And this book is a big uh, example of that. It's something that's going to outlive all of us. Now, um, as we said earlier, we're, st we're addressing the future of the country. What message do you have for the future and for the custodians of the future in very direct, direct words? This man is looking for a sound bite. <laughs> A no real message. Uh, only this. My message is integrated, can be extracted from everything I write and see and so on. But you, if you're looking for sound bites, all, all, I'm, all I will say, yeah, on behalf of the future, mm -hmm. is that we just restore, restore the lost humanity in our various communities. Because that humanity is being lost. We, we watch it, we live it day by day. You are exempted from it, you only read about it. But those of us who live inside it, who watch it, see the degradation of human, of, of relationships, uh, the distrust, the level of distrust, which is of course based on, um, very often on wrong information, uh, the misuse of even a marvelous technology like internet the abuse of it by, there was a, yeah, talking about the first in everything, you know, there was a, one of these polls taken recently, uh, and as usual, we come out on top about, <laughs> <coughs> about which nation abuses internet the most. <laughs> yes, and even that technology is being degraded and mostly by our own Nigerian people being in abuse. The result is that many intelligent people are fleeing uh, that, that, that community of internet because it's been taken over by the barbarians. And most of those barbarians come from among our people. So how is that for a sound bite? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been a lovely evening. Um, at this point, I'd like to call Yemi Adu, the CEO of um, Dano Ford, who are the organizers behind the night, to say a few words about the evening. <laughs> Microphone, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is surreal for me. You know, as a nine-year-old boy, <laughs> I experienced professor for the first time. I, <clears throat> I was luckily in my school playing um, Lion and the Jewel. I saw it at the National Theatre. And, you know, we are formed as a person by the people around us, people we observe, people will hear us speak. And I believe in this room, you know, a lot of people have said that the best of Nigeria keep leaving Nigeria. A lot of people here 
I've been influenced by you. You know, the last 24 hours for me has been unbelievable. Spending time with this great man at the age of 87, still kicking it, you know, please. I thank everyone for the support because um, as a Yoruba boy, they say when you, when you um, call a party and there are no people to serve the food, you know,